There you go, now take a bite. And I just had such a blast being this absolute crazy person. When you say those kinds of lines, you can't say them with a frown on your face. You have to say them with a smile. I'll leave this hat with you. What has he been doing in the meantime that we didn't see him, you know? What, what has he been up to? How was he able to achieve this kind of power, you know? And that stuff is just like daydream fodder. You're watching convention coverage. Brandon Potter. Who, who all here is here for uh, for like One Piece stuff? Show of hands. There we go. Excellent. Okay. And who is here because they know me from something else? Like, ah, oh, yes, Cool yeah. Rumble. I love that one. So I think we can talk about sort of anything, guys. Uh, I, I'm not quite as a, like encyclopedic in terms of my knowledge of One Piece as some folks are. But uh, we can talk about acting. We can talk about any of the other projects I've been in, what it's like to be in the booth. We can talk about anything. Anything, guys. Let's open up and really share with each other here today. What interests you in voice acting? Well, there's, there's a lot of fun stuff with voice acting. Because, you know, when you're acting on stage or you're acting on screen, you sort of have to use your whole body to tell the story, right? So my voice can be doing one thing and my body can be doing another, right? And that's how people get the story or the meaning of the moment. And in voice acting, it kind of all has to be in your voice. Like they need to hear how heavy the stone is with your voice. They need to hear how trying the moment is with your voice. You don't have your body to lean on, right? And that's a, it's a lot of fun. It's its own sort of unique challenge. Uh, there are some technical aspects to voice acting that I just thought were interesting, like matching what we call the flaps, the mouth movements. I think that's a, a technical skill that's fun. And also doing things like video games, you know, where you have to do lots of like, hua, 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 and scream all the time. You know, you kind of develop an, a, a technique so that that's a, a little bit more sustainable. I mean, obviously it ruins your throat anyway, but yeah, you know, the, that, that kind of technical stuff and technique is really a, a fascinating part of voice acting. And I think that, that might have been what got me into it, yeah. Is there any, uh, anything you do to get into the mode for doing struggle sounds or struggle noises? Yeah, I do the struggle. Yeah. So I, when, I, when I used to be in the booth, you know, and I was doing like a really epic thing, I'd be like, ooh, this line needs a power pull down, you know? So I'd be like, you'll never get away. You know what I mean? Like you, you got to do the stuff in the booth or when you're struggling with something, you can actually lift it. <clears throat> you know, you got to do it with your body so that it can appear uh, in your voice. So I want to say that I'm, my f most favorite role aside from One Piece is Kenji Haruma from School yeah. Rumble. It's part, that was my childhood anime growing enough. So my basic question is: Do you have any, do you have any favorite memories or s scenes from the show when working on it? I have a lot of favorite memories from working on that show. It was um, it was a show that I got to work on with my very good friend Brina Palencia. Do you guys know who she is? She voices Tony Tony Chomper in One Piece along with a lot of other sort of famous roles. She's like Moxie in Borderlands and stuff like that. And that's right, yeah. So she's done a ton of stuff, but back in those days we were kind of just getting started out. I've known Brina since high school. So it sort of felt like I was just making funny voices with my friends because that is in fact exactly what I was doing. I was just making funny voices with my friends. So we had a lot of fun in the booth. There's one episode where there is a pig in School Rumble, and he says, pwee, pwee. And uh, I begged and pleaded to voice that pig so that I could go, pwee, pwee. Because the rest of the time, Kenji Harum is all big, and you know, he's got this kind of gruff voice. Ah, oh, Tenma, you know, that sort of stuff. And to be like a little cute pig, I thought, was uh, my crowning voice acting achievement. Oh, and don't forget scrumptious, <laughs> right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Man, you've got a good memory. What was your like, favorite voice acting job thing? I don't know. You know, Kenji Harma is definitely near and dear to my heart. And Shanks is, of course, because like, it, this has been like a 15 year long part that I've had, right? I only do like one or two lines a year, but I've been doing one or two lines for like 15 years now. And to see the impact that it's had on people, right, especially through the I mean, One Piece just sort of, its audience got so big and so passionate, right, that it's hard for that not to be my favorite just because, you know, it hits me right in the feels to see people responding to this work in a really, really positive way. But there's some stuff that's just fun. I, I don't know, if, has, anyone, has, has anyone ever heard of an anime called uh, 91 Days? Uh, it's kind of an obscure one, but I play this guy called Fongo, and he's an absolute psychopath. 
And I had such a good time with him. He like, I'm sorry if there's kids here, but like grinds up his enemies into meat and serves it to the rest of his enemies. Uh, he does all of this horrible stuff and he sort of like laughs about, there you go, now take a bite. You know, that kind of stuff. And I just had such a blast being this absolute crazy person. Uh, so yeah, I think that might be the most fun that I've had, but what means the most is, is probably Shanks. What interests you in the voice acting as Shanks? Well, I think the most interesting thing about Shanks is we know he's this kind person, right? Like he's like this father figure to Luffy and um, I, I love being that kind person in the booth. It's nice because when you say those kinds of lines, you can't say them with a frown on your face. You have to say them with a smile. I'll leave this hat with you, right? You don't say that with a frown on your face. It's a good thing. But he's also so incredibly powerful and has achieved this sort of station, this rank, you know? I think the most interesting thing about it is what has he been doing in the meantime that we didn't see him, you know? What, what has he been up to? How was he able to achieve this kind of power, you know? And that stuff is just like daydream fodder, you know? You just think, I, I mean, I think about that, you know, like, oh my gosh, what has he been up to? How did he, how did he become a captain? How did he become an emperor? How did he become all of this stuff, you know? Uh, so I love thinking about that and um, injecting that sort of hardcore sternness when he is hardcore and stern because uh, he's got that kind side, but he also will fight, right? He will, in fact, fight. Considering Shanks lost his arm so early on, how much more powerful do you think he'd be if he had both arms still? This is a very good question, and I think that nothing would stop him. I, I don't think it matters. I think that he would have achieved the same sort of power. I think that he would be in the same place that he is in life. I, because like he lost that arm and was so immediately not bitter about it. Like he, I think he knew something. I think he believed in himself. He believed in what he was after and that having an arm is a nice thing to have, but being able-bodied isn't the chief thing, you know? It's having that uh, strength of soul, right? And he has that. So yeah, that's a good question. And I've definitely thought about it too. So uh, thanks for bringing it up. What do you guys think? Do you think that he would be like somewhere else if he had both of his arms? Nah, how could he be even more powerful than he already is, right? Yeah. Oh yeah? Yeah, he definitely does, doesn't he? Well, he's, he's definitely got the hat on, you know. <laughs> what was your favorite part of playing Gunhead? Uh, weirdly enough, my favorite part with Gunhead was kind of the same as Shanks, but goofier, right? Uh, I loved all the battle stuff because he's such a cool character, right? His design is so awesome. Like, I think he actually just looks like a cool character. The design is great. But then to have all those like teachy mentor moments where he's so like, I don't know if tender is the right word, but like caring and considerate. Getting to do those two things in the booth, I think, uh, are, are always fascinating to me. Playing two sides of a person are the most fascinating things to me, and Gunhead has that too, in a much goofier way than someone like Shanks does, right? Uh, you had to do an uh, at-home voice recording. That's right. Um, and I guess, how does that compare, and like, are you able to go back into the booth now, or is it still kind of at-home stuff? Well, it depends, you know? Um, so after people figured out how to record at home and do that really well, some studios were like, I don't know, use your home rig, it sounds great, you know, and they don't have to bring anyone in, they don't have to hire an engineer because you're doing the engineering, you know? So, okay, maybe I should back up and start from the beginning. So when we go into a booth, right, there's, a, there's an engineer there that has uh, the controls for the sound recording, he puts the image up on the screen, uh, he makes uh, the words fit into the flaps if you don't do a good enough job. So that's what engineers do and they're really talented and they make things go very, very quickly. When it was time for at-home recording, we had to be our own engineers. So I was kind of looking at the screen to try and act, I was looking at the words to know what to say and then I was also looking at uh, an audio interface to figure out if this was going into the flaps in the correct way. So it was a big challenge uh, to do all of that stuff at once in 
like a tiny little closet in my case. I was literally setting up uh, sound recording equipment in a closet. Uh, and some studios liked that even after because they didn't have to maintain a studio space anymore because you could just do it on your own. Uh, going back into the booth, I feel like, oh, this is so much easier oh, because there's a real life professional taking care of all of the audio recording stuff. So all I have to do now is just act and have fun. So to answer your question, I much prefer going into the studio and having a professional record me instead of me messing up my way through the entire process. Do you feel like that's like built up your your knowledge on how the engineers do their gig and that that way you understand how to basically deliver the best performances? Uh, yes, but now I know everything that I don't know. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like I could look at what someone's doing in the booth or what someone's doing in the control room and say, I might have a suggestion, but I'm just going to keep that to myself and let the pro do what they're doing. Y you know what I mean? So in a weird way, it made me like a, uh, a little bit easier to work with. Yeah, I think that was the point of your question. Yeah, it definitely made me easier to work with, I think. Yeah. What was your reaction to finding out that Shanks would be such a big part of Film Red, um, considering he hasn't really shown up in any of the previous One Piece movies? So when I found out that One Piece Film Red was going to feature Shanks, uh, I had a few reactions. My first reaction was, hooray, I get to go and play with my friends. Uh, the second reaction was, oh, wait a minute, is One Piece actually entering the end game? You know, because uh, Shanks is kind of this bookend character, you know, if they're bringing him in, that means big stuff is happening. So at first I was very, very excited, and then I actually kind of got a little bit sad or something, thinking that the story was going to actually really conclude, you know? So it was sort of an emotional thing. And I realized that I wasn't the only one that was having that experience. You know, when I talked to Anthony, who directed that movie, he was like, yeah, I think this is real. This is not a drill. The story is, is doing big things. And I think that's because it, it has to wrap up eventually. Uh, you know? So I know that Oda himself actually picked out a lot of the actors. What was your experience meeting Oda? It's sort of like meeting a a Jedi, if he doesn't have business with you, then he doesn't really talk to you. So, I mean, I've like uh, seen him before, but I don't know that I've ever really met him, you know. Uh, but the way that he's talked about in these sort of like hushed tones, you know, like this is the this is the seed of it all. This is the origin of it all. I think that's been fascinating to watch his sort of reputation and like mystique grow over the last 20 years. Uh, yeah, it's super cool. Actually, that actually opens up another question because we were talking about Star Wars. Mm -hmm. What, uh, if you could, what would be your dream role in any of the Star Wars franchise? Like an extant role? Like something that's already happened? Or like I get to make up my own role? You get to make up your own role. Like, <laughs> have fun with it. <laughs> yeah, just like, uh, think. I would clearly be a, a Sith apprentice looking to, I mean, obviously, yeah. Like, uh, I got pointy eyebrows, I got a deep voice. Clearly, I'm going to be a bad guy, and I'm going to have a ton of fun doing it. <laughs> and I need one of those red lightsabers, obviously. There's another um, childhood fa favorite of mine you wor worked on was Black, was Black Cat at Ez. I'm pr it's been years, I'm probably going to butcher his name as Sven Velf Velf yeah, from Sven Volfied. V Sven yeah, Sven Volfied. Sven Volfied from Akkad. Um, wh what was it like, like playing as him since he's kind of just a wacky character but is also like super serious at the same time that cares a lot about his friends and such? So Black Cat was actually kind of a fun story. That was the first time I ever auditioned to be in an anime. Uh, and it was for a are you guys familiar with the term cattle call audition? Yeah, I see like one knowing nod uh, in the audience there. Yeah, so I, I'm guessing you're an actor and have been to this sort of thing before, no? Okay. So, for everyone except for her, a cattle call audition is when they bring in like hundreds of people, right? And everyone reads the same few lines. And uh, again, my friend, uh, Brina and Leah Clark. Do you guys know Leah Clark? She's a cool VA. Um, I was just getting done with 
uh, my undergrad in college. I got in a theater degree, foolishly, but that's what I did. And, uh, and they said, well, you should come and do this audition. And it was a cattle call audition, which means that I would be put on a list to be Walla. Do you guys know what Walla is? Mm -hmm. Like all the background stuff? Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, I guess I can be, I'll get on the Walla list doing this cattle call audition. But uh, I was auditioning for a guy named Tyler, who was a, a big director at uh, uh, Funimation at the time is what it was. And uh, so even when I was like 24, my voice sounded like this. So I sounded like a, you know, like a hard-boiled detective even when I was a kid, which made getting on-screen roles hard because my voice didn't look like my face, but it was kind of useful to do voice acting stuff. So we, we had these lines that were like these hard-boiled detective lines, you know, like, I knew things were gonna be different when that dame walked in the door, you know, that kind of stuff. But that's how I sounded, you know, and I was like 20. So I did some of those lines and Tyler's like, and you've never done this before? And I was like, no, and he's like, but you do sound like that. And I was like, I do sound like that. And he's like, but you have no experience. And I was like, I have no experience. And he was like, but you do sound like that. And I was like, I do sound like that. So I ended up getting this like kind of big role in this yeah, little show, but it was the best thing that could ever happen to me because I got to do like that sort of hard boiled stuff and the wacky stuff, which we've already talked about. I like doing two sides of a character. But the cool thing was is that I got to learn very, very fast because I had a whole bunch of lines and a whole bunch of stuff to do in the show. And, uh, and I was just in the studio all the time. So I got to be in the booth for hundreds of hours doing this show. And uh, when I was walking down the hall, you know, someone would be like, hey, what, what are you doing? I'd be like, oh, I'm gonna go get some water. He's like, well, come in and do this bit part for me real quick. So like in those four months or whatever, while I was doing Black Cat, I ended up getting into a whole bunch of other people's booths. So I got to make some relationships and have a little bit of fun playing and uh, yeah, that was a, an instrumental role in uh, getting a bunch of other parts, and it was just a ton of fun. Have you done a lot of wall acting? Uh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I've been in so many booths with lots of other sweaty dudes. Uh, in the wall yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> in, in the wall of lines, just, uh, just grunting and dying and running from <laughs> vampires and dragons and, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I got... <laughs> Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to think about when the last time I was, I was in the booth uh, doing wall. It wasn't all that long ago, but there was definitely like, there was pre- We would put like four people in a booth and all of us were screaming at the top of our lungs, uh, which makes for a, let's just say a humid recording experience. <laughs> yeah, nice and muggy in there. Yeah, and I know that you have some experience with like uh, Dragon Ball too, so a bit of screaming in that, right? Oh my gosh, <laughs> yeah. So it, anyone who ever worked at, uh, you know, what's if they've been there for any amount of time, it, you dig through their resume long enough, you'll see some Dragon Ball Z. It's a big property, it's gone on for a long time, and lots of people are running and screaming and dying, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, basically everyone has done like the, you know, <laughs> spend eight hours doing that, you know. Uh, and then cancel your recording sessions the next day. That's how that works. You spend all day screaming and then one day croaking, you know. Hi, how are you? Just do a Dragon Ball, it's fine. Do you have any more funny or unique like booth stories that maybe no one's heard yet? <laughs> what used to happen is, you know, because we record one at a time, right? Uh, so we would leave what we call bombs for the actors that would come in after us. And what I mean by a bomb is, is that you would say a line that is not the line that the next character would have to respond to, you know? Uh, so, for example, if your character is reaching out to someone, take my hand if you wanna live, right? And the other character has to have a nice tearful response, you have to go on without me, right? So they, the other actor would be working on getting up to this sort of emotional place. Oh, you have to go on without and they're expecting the line, take my hand if you want to live. But what you do is cleverly say, I can't stop farting and I need you to help, you know, which ruins their take. Uh, everyone gets a good giggle and we move on and put in the correct lines. This was a fairly common practice at Funimation for a while. And there were varying degrees of, um, how shall I say this, profanity used in these bombs. But that practice had to be stomped out and eradicated because not once or twice or three times, but like 
Lots of times these bombs made it through to the final mix. Yeah, so when the big boss man sees, uh, I can't stop farting and I need your help, you know, uh, we had to get like memos from the company all the way down to all the engineers, to all the actors. You couldn't even so much as say the word bomb in the booth without getting a stern talking to. So yeah, that's a little, uh, little peek behind the curtain for you. <laughs> Just ruining everything. <laughs> Just ruining everything. It's what we do. <laughs> what do you think about like Shanks' relationships with other pirates like Buggy or Mihawk? Because we've seen him like talk to these people every now and then, but that's like kind of it. And even with Buggy, like he has this long history with him and Buggy hates him now. <laughs> so like, what do you think of that? It's among those things that are like, uh, I, I, I'm excited to see if we get more glimpses into those sorts of relationships, you know? Because it is unlikely that he has had a nice, pleasant relationship with all of the other pirates, right? Like there, there has definitely been tussling. Like there's a reason that Buggy hates him, right? It's not just jealousy. So I, I imagine that he is connected with most of them, right? Otherwise, how would he achieve the rank and station that he has? And I imagine that it is not all amiable. I imagine that there's some acrimony, that he's made some enemies. But I would also say this, that I, I think that I, I believe in Shanks's essentially good nature. So if he is on another pirate's bad side, it's because Shanks was doing the right thing and they were doing the wrong thing. That's what I think. Well, what do you think of, how do you think Shanks would have reacted to finding out Buggy became, spoiler, became an emperor, spoilers? How do you think he would have reacted to that? <laughs> I don't think he ever would have prepared for that. You know what I mean? But now that that is the case, I think he knows how to. I think he knows how to deal with Buggy. You know what I mean? So I don't think he would have counted on it. But now that that's happening, that's actually kind of an ace in his sleeve, right? Because he knows exactly what buttons to push with Buggy. How does voice acting in video games compare to a TV series, and how do you enjoy that? I think that. Are, are there a bunch of gamers here? Yeah. Yeah. So you guys know how video games sound, you know? They, every little punch has like a hoo ha hoo ha you know, all, all those sort of wacky noises, right? So, you know, when outside of Dragon Ball Z, when you're acting in like a TV or, or, or something like that, there's more narrative, right? You're like communicating meaning, right? There's, there's a... The, the, there's a there's a message, right? And with video games, it's like an instant feedback feeling thing, right? With all the sort of grunting and screaming. So you can do like, you know, voice acting in anime or cartoons all day long. Uh, whereas like with video games, doing that fighting stuff, you got a day or two in you, then uh, that's kind of it. You might need to take a little bit of a break. There's one difference though. If you do video games that are really story heavy, um, then they animate the characters to your mouth, which allows a whole bunch of freedom. So I guess the answer is, in some video games, you get way more freedom, because uh, like during the cutscenes and stuff, they will match what you're doing, right? Uh, versus like, in some video games, you have way less freedom, because it's like fighting stuff, right? So you're just running and dying and getting punched and punching and throwing fireballs or lightning or, or whatever, you know? Uh, so it just kind of, yeah, it depends, but it's definitely different. Uh, what is your favorite school rumble moment? Uh, I have so many of them. So it would either be when the captain is giving him the pen, right? And like the little bone pen somehow turns into this like giant, you know, fish carcass mace, you know, and it's like this, this epic thing where he's getting like a harpoon from Ishmael or something, I don't know. Uh, or do you remember when he gets busted in... Uh, at the sleepover in the room and he has to explain that he's not like just a horrible creep, you know, that like his heart actually is in the right place. Uh, th but there's a ton of moments in School Rumble that like I love. But I think those two, because it sort of encapsulates, you know, him thinking of himself and his story in terms of this like epic struggle for creating the perfect manga. And then this like, uh, this trip he's on with this girl that he loves, you know. Yeah. So how do you recover after you've done a really rough voice acting session? Like you usually take a day off. Yeah. Is there anything else you do? Yeah, hydrate. Mm -hmm. Like everyone has all these like, cool potions. Ooh, there's like honey and tea and uh, hot toddy. Dude, it's just water. 
just water and don't talk for a while. That's it. Anyone who says that there's some sort of magic potion that will solve it, they are trying their best to make their throat better. But it's water. Water and rest. Shanks in one piece. Um, since there's a thousand and seventy episodes, would you ever get tired playing your character in one piece? No, and I'll tell you why. Because the show is so expansive and so big and it has reached so many people and it means something to, to so many people. And that's the whole reason to do any of this stuff to begin with, is to like share a story with strangers that we all can sort of talk about and, uh, uh, and live through together, right? So I will, I will never get tired of, of being involved in that experience. Uh, it's a long gig. There's a, you know, I come in once every other year or whatever to do Shanks stuff and it doesn't matter what I'm doing, I will drop it and I will go and record Shanks for that very reason so that we can do stuff like this. And I don't know, man, like I see people like parents pass one piece on to their children, children turn on their parents to it. So it turns into this kind of like multi-generational thing. Like, no, I will never get tired of that. Yeah, good question, man. I'm currently watching The Chosen, and I recognize you. Um, do you play Quintus? I do, yeah. Yeah, how, what was it like playing The Chosen? Because from what I heard, um, I guess like it's not a very big production. It's kind of small people are just pitching in money to like, what was that like? What was the experience like traveling and like recording with like how it is? Well, the show has changed. So we're on season four right now. And uh, when the show started, it was crowdfunded but it wasn't ever exactly small. It was the largest crowdfunded media project ever. So uh, that means that it was, a even though it was crowdfunded, which sort of typically means small, it actually got pretty big. So say for example in season one, it's a crowdfunded show, right? But we were able to have custom made Bronze Age boats built to do all the fishing scenes, yeah. And then now, uh, after, like we're with Lionsgate, we're on CW uh, every Sunday now. Uh, and we've had like the theatrical releases and stuff like that. So now we've gone beyond just building boats. There's an actual real Bronze Age village that's being built. It's not a set. I mean, there's like brick and mortar villages that are functional that we shoot the show in. So it is bonkers big like the in terms of the set like we're not just using one camera on a crane there's like four camera setups 300 extras when they did the feeding of the 5000 that was 5000 real extras yeah it's uh it, it's nuts now that said it's a giant show but i think it's sort of remarkable how free and easy the set is. The director's a really, really nice guy. Instead of saying action, he says, here we play. So that it kind of fosters this sense of like exploration and creative play, which is really cool. Um, and every season, the ante is upped just a little bit more in terms of production value and what people can bring to it. Yeah, thanks for asking a question about The Chosen. That's really cool. All right, I think that's actually hitting the end of our panel. And anyway, I want you all to give a round of applause for Brandon Potter. Hey, thanks so much for uh, coming and chatting.